Welcome to the Devoted City Church podcast. Our mission is to help people find, trust, and follow Jesus. To learn more about our church, visit devotedcity.com. In today's episode, you'll hear a message from our lead pastor, Donnie Williams, or a member of our teaching team. Thank you for being at Devoted City Church today. If you're at our Cary campus, thanks for joining us today. And if you're watching online, I hope you enjoy the day. We would love to see you in person at one of our locations. So I hope you come and check us out. We are in uh, this series called The Jesus I Never Knew because we're talking about some things that Jesus said in the book of Revelation that might sound harsh, uh, that might sound different than, than words that you would expect Jesus to say. Uh, we're just looking at two chapters in the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation 2 and 3, where Jesus has a message through the apostle John for the church at that time and for the church all time. There's seven churches he speaks to. The number seven in scripture in prophetic literature uh, it means completeness. So it's the complete message for the church for all time and all churches. So these messages that we read from Jesus are for us. We're going to look at the context of what they meant then and then how we apply that to our culture uh, today in the church. The book of Revelation was written by the apostle John. He was the last living apostle and the only one, according to church history, uh, that died of natural causes. The rest of them were martyred. And we've already looked at two churches uh, and we're on the third church today. And here's what we found out. Jesus is perfectly a priest and he's perfectly a prophet. A priest is who tells you uh, it's going to be okay, puts their arm around you, offers words of peace, comfort, forgiveness. And a prophet is someone who says what needs to be said and it doesn't matter how it makes feel. Uh, they say it because it needs to be said. Jesus is perfectly both of those. And we have heard Jesus tell a church to repent, which means stop doing what you're doing and turn back to me. We have heard Jesus say, uh, church, you need to know your, your, uh, your persecution is seen by me because out of the two churches we've looked at, one he had uh, compliments for, but he also had some condemnation for. The one we looked at last week, the church in Smyrna, uh, that church only had compliments and encouragement from Jesus because being a perfect priest, Jesus knew they were not in a place because of the persecution they were dealing with where they could receive uh, anything other than a priestly conversation. So because Jesus is perfect, he knows what people need when they need to hear it. Uh, two of the five churches, uh, he offers no challenge. He only offers uh, commendation to them and tells them how great they're doing and that it's going to be okay. So the church we're looking at today uh, is a church in a town called Pergamum, which is in uh, modern-day Turkey. Then it was called Asia Minor. But before we do that, I just want to pray for the day as we get started on this very challenging message and words that come from Jesus. God, we uh, bring before you our hearts uh, as we read your word, as we study your word, as we're convicted by it. May, may people in this room feel uh, the power of your Holy Spirit, whether they're in this room or in another room or watching online. Uh, may you speak through your words to people today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. So it was around the year, um, somewhere around the year 2000, that this bumper sticker became popular. Remember that? It started to get popular. And, and here's, here's what it means. Uh, it means that, oh, hey, we should just all coexist. Now, if you take that to mean uh, we should be kind, uh, we should be uh, understanding, we should give a listening ear, and we should uh, try to be peaceful with everybody. Absolutely, that's true, but that's not what it means. Here's what it means. That means every symbol on that bumper sticker is equal. That it's all equal, and because it's all equal, just get along. But there's one symbol on that bumper sticker that's above all others. There's only one stick, uh, symbol on that bumper sticker that would say, uh, I am the way, the only way. Nobody can have a relationship with God without me. That's what Jesus said. To most people, this bumper sticker means 
compromise. It means compromising enough to where we can boil it all down and realize, hey, we're all seeking after something greater in life. And so uh, why don't we just respect that you do and respect that you do? And I arrived at a different place and that may not be the same place as you, but hey, we're all on a journey and it's all a pathway to the same God. That is compromise. And here's what we're gonna find out about compromise today. Faith in God cannot coexist with compromise. A few years ago, I was hanging out with a friend who's a pastor, and he was telling me about this family that he had gotten to know through his kids. And in that conversation, he mentioned that they, uh, that they were Buddhist. And he mentioned what great people they were, which I'm sure they were, uh, how kind they were, which I'm sure they were, how peaceful they were, which I'm sure all of that's true. Uh, and I wouldn't disagree with that, but here's what he said that blew me away. He said, when I see them peaceful and they love people and they care about people and they're living this pathway that they found, there's nothing in me that compels me to have them convert to Jesus. And I was like, you got to be kidding. I'd like to say I was more confrontational, but I wasn't at that time. And I thought, you're teaching people God's word and you're not even convicted enough to tell somebody who's already nice and kind, hey, let me tell you about the nicest, kindest person that ever lived and how you can know him. That is compromise. That is saying, hey, you're fine the way you are, I'm fine the way I am and we're just gonna compromise and boil it all down. Think of all the false ideas that are in our culture today the way your kids may be being taught, may be being taught, the way it seems there's no boundaries around anything. And even in the church world where I live in, in all my life is it's become cool to have a church that ends up looking very much like the world looks. And when that happens, can it fill rooms? Of course, but it'll never filled hearts with the spirit of God. And so we're in this culture where it would be very easy for us to compromise. It would be very easy to say, you know what, let's just, let's just stop talking about that. Let's not deal with that. And let's just, let's just come to a place where we can all compromise. Fact is faith in God cannot coexist with compromise. And we're going to hear Jesus say some priestly words to this church that we're talking about today. And he's also going to say some prophetic words that are harsh. Every prophetic, harsh word that Jesus says is because he loves people and he wants to have a relationship with people. That's why he might say and does say harsh things that people don't want to hear. If you're a parent, if you're a good parent, there will come a time you have to say some harsh words to your kids. I've raised three, can I get an amen about the harsh words? You just have to, why? Because they're learning and if we don't guide and teach, who knows where they're gonna end up and sometimes when they make bad decisions just like we all did as kids, if we don't sit them down and say, look at me, listen to me, you do that again, there's gonna be problems around here. If you don't stop that, There's gonna be a lot of trouble in your life. There are times as a parent, you have to say those things. Is it because you don't like them? No, it's because you love them. Is it because you don't want them to have any fun? No, it's because you desperately love them and you don't want them to have any regret. The greatest thing we can do as a parent is to minimize the regret our kids have to live through for the dumb decisions they might make. I made a lot of dumb decisions as a kid. And I don't want my kid, and I didn't want my kids when they were little, I didn't want to have them do the same things. And so as Jesus speaks to this church today, who were, they were living in a culture of compromise, he does so in every word he says because he loved them so much. It's in Revelation 2, beginning at verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. 
You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Jesus is going to talk about Satan today. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. He's already talked about them earlier in chapter 2. I will soon come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus is challenging people who teach false teaching to a fight. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now, the important thing to understand when we're looking at what any gospel, any New Testament writer is saying, anything Jesus says, we need to look at the context. So the context of what Jesus said in this city, it was in modern day Turkey, then it was called Asia Minor. Uh, you can actually go there today. This is what it looks like. Look at this slide on the screen. If you went there today, this is what you would see. These are the ruins of the city of Pergamum. You can Google Earth it and look at it. See that amphitheater? That would seat 10,000 people. And according to people who have been there, the acoustics are amazing. And you can hear all the way up in what we would call the nosebleed seats. The thing about that city was it was a spiritual city. They worshiped idols. They worshiped the emperor of Rome. They had to if they didn't want to be persecuted. It became a place of healing where people would go uh, in hopes of getting healed. And in all of those ruins, there are temples to false gods, made up gods, emperor worship. This is what it would have looked like back in their day when, when we were in, in the first and second century. Put the next slide up there. That's an artist's rendering of what it may have looked like. So this is what people in this church would have walked around every day. And it's, it, you look at that and say, what architectural wonder. That's great. First and second century, that looks awesome. How'd they keep that so white back then? How'd they keep it so clean? But this is what they would have had to interact with every single day of their lives. Multiple gods, multiple temples, where unspeakable things happened, where people went to worship it was the prevailing winds of culture to do idol worship and emperor worship and to pick your God and worship that God. It was a culture where it would have been very easy for Christians to compromise. And as we read each of these letters, here's what we find out. The church in the first and second century especially, they were being persecuted they were not being persecuted for being followers of Jesus, for saying, I'm a Christian. They were being persecuted for saying they were a Christian and then refusing to compromise. If they say that they were a Christian, yet they would do uh, emperor worship, that's okay. If they would say they're a Christian and still go by the, the temple that, to Zeus or whatever God it was to and, and put a sacrifice there, that's okay. So the culture didn't have a problem with them being a Christian. The culture had a problem with them being a Christian who stood up for something. And that hasn't changed in 2,000 years. There's probably no one in culture that would have a problem with somebody being a Christian. The problem comes in when Christians stand up for what's true and what's right. See, like them, we now live in a culture that's very easy for people who follow Jesus to compromise. And think, well, everybody thinks this, and I'm reading this, and I'm seeing all these one-liner posts, and, and yeah, that, that, that seems fine. I mean, if we don't compromise, nobody's ever going to listen to us. I would say if we do compromise, nobody needs to listen to us. So this is not the time to compromise. Because faith and compromise cannot coexist. 
He says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. So why would Jesus come wielding a sword? Well, it's a symbol that means the word of God. So Jesus had, earlier, I, when John first had the vision of Jesus speaking to him, when he first uh, began to write down these words, he referred to Jesus, he had this vision of Jesus with a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, which means the words of God cut. The words of God uh, can change. The words of God can be a scalpel and get the things out of our life that need to be out of our life. In fact, in Hebrews chapter four, this was not on the screen, it says this. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the word of God being re Referred to as a sword, a double-edged sword, means it is effective. It is effective for teaching. It is effective for rebuke. It is effective for encouragement. The word of God is effective. And so Jesus says some things that cut. Jesus says some things that will divide those who compromise from those who will not. This is why Anytime you see someone start to have a lower view of scripture. Now that's happening in the church today in record numbers. I see it, I read it, I'm blown away by it. Watching people have a lower and lower view of scripture, big names, famous preachers, all of a sudden their view of scripture is lower and they're jumping into this thing that's best described as a pro progressive movement of Christians and churches have a lower view of scripture because when you have a lower view of scripture, it doesn't have authority in your life. God's words are not what you base your life on. God's words are no longer what you allow to guide yourself and you let your feelings guide yourself because a high view of scripture equals a high view of accountability. Accountability to something supernatural and outside of self. And when people move to a lower view of scripture, they quickly move to the religion of self instead of surrender. And then whatever self wants is what's worshiped. That's why a lack of surrender that's why being willing to compromise will always carry with it a lower view of Scripture. Now, they had some people that stayed true to, to the Word. Some compromised, and then Jesus goes on to say, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lived. I love the way Jesus does not mince words. They were worshiping Satan. It might have been called uh, Zeus. It might have been called some other god. It might have been called the emperor. At the end of the day, they were worshiping Satan, and that's what Jesus acknowledged. And false teaching can have all kinds of different names of what you call it, but at the end of the day, you're either submitting to Christ or you're committing to Satan. That's your only two options. And so Jesus is just saying, look, you are, you are in a place where Satan lives, and some of you have been able to be in that place, and yet you haven't compromised in spite of someone getting killed for their faith. Just imagine their temptation to compromise when, like if they would have had social media in that day, you're, and you were a Christian, all of your friends would have been posting Instagram photos of being in front of Zeus's really awesome looking temple saying, hung out with Zeus today, or whatever. That would have been what your friends would be doing and then the temptation to compromise would have been great and people would have been moved in that direction but some of them didn't. And Jesus is commending them for staying strong, even though they were in the middle of demonic, satanic activity, they did not renounce their faith. 
and he refers to a guy that's only mentioned once in Scripture, Antipas. History says he was a church leader, and he was killed for following Jesus and not being willing to compromise. And after he commends them for their strength, he says this, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. He's jumping into prophet mode now. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. So whatever the teaching of Balaam is, we don't want that. We don't want to do that. See, what Balaam did, he wanted to curse Israel. God wouldn't allow him to curse Israel, so he went to this king, the, king, the Moabite king, Balak, and he told him how to do it. And he said, here's how you entice those Israelites. Get them to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Now, that might make us think, well, what's a big deal? It's a steak. What's a big deal? I don't understand. How you got the steak, what's, what's it matter? Well, to them, if you ate meat sacrificed to an idol, you were doing the same thing as worshiping that idol. So it was a big deal to go pick up a bull or a goat or a sheep that had been sacrificed to idols and then go home and cook up that meat. To them, it was the same as worshiping an idol because now that meat was forever defiled because it was given and sacrificed in the name of Satan or whatever they chose to call the false god. And so it was a big deal. And so it was happening. You read about it over and over. It starts early in in the book of Acts. They were struggling with, uh, should they allow people to eat meat sacrificed to idols? And what came down is they're not going to change their idea, their view that it's bad, so don't do it. And then he convinced them that sexual immorality was the way to go. And as I'm reading through this, I'm like, again? Like, we're talking about sexual immorality again. So when we committed, we're going to teach through God's word, all of it, every verse, the totality of it, no matter what it says, it talks about sexual immorality a lot. And I'm like, I, I got to go through that again. So evidently, it's hard for humans to get that one. I think we're okay not eating meat sacrificed to idols. I think we've conquered that one. I think we're all okay. But the other one, it's like, here it is again. I got to bring it up again. It's not like I'm sitting there going, how can I talk about sexual immorality today? I don't think about that. But when I read God's word, boom, there it is. So I'll go through this again. Let me make a list of everything that's sexually moral because the list of immorality is much larger. So let's just start. If you have a piece of paper, uh, number one, here's the first uh, in the list of things that are sexually moral. Uh, Sexual relations between a husband and a wife, number one. There is no number two. That's it. (laughs) That's it. Everything else is immoral. No matter how you might want it to be different, feel it should be different, get upset with God because it's different, take that up with him because that's what the Bible defines as sexual immorality, sex outside the bonds of a man and a woman in marriage. Everything else is a mockery. Now, this teaching of eating meat sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality, it would have been embraced because it was restraint-free living. And Jesus said, Those of you that are doing that and those of you that are supporting that, it is sin. And then the teachings of the Nicolaitans, which would have been the same, meat and sexuality. And that teaching had spread throughout the church. So here's, here's, evidently it's mentioned all these times because they had a problem uh, eating the wrong things and sleeping with the wrong people. All throughout the New Testament. Faith in God cannot coexist with compromise. In Jude chapter one, verse four, it says this. For certain people have crept in, this song about in the church, have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek word for sensuality there means literally to throw off all sexual restraint. And if you think about it, entire uh, hundreds of year old denominations are splitting over that issue right there. Entire churches are becoming a center of false teaching because that idolatry is alive and well, throwing off God-centered sexuality and morality 
just to teach that which is false. We've never lived in our lifetimes at a time where it's been easier to compromise. It's in the New Testament a lot because God knew that humans would have a hard time not compromising. But just like Jesus did for them, he does the same thing for us, and that's he never offers condemnation without the opportunity to be forgiven. Likewise, you also hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Faith in God cannot coexist with compromise. See, compromise puts you in a position of being in opposition to Jesus. Repentance puts you in a relationship with Jesus. So as strongly as he condemned people, he just as strongly offers forgiveness to people. So what does all that mean to us today, 2,000 years later? There's never been a greater time in our lifetime to be a faithful witness. And just like in the first century, you won't be persecuted just for being a Christian or made fun of or probably not. But you will be for being a Christian that stands up for what's true and right. See, this church was dealing with it in two ways. It was coming from the inside through false teaching and it was coming from the outside through all those false gods that you saw represented on that mountain. And while Satan is attacking from the outside, which is really obvious, we can see that, he also got people on the inside that kept their beliefs, their real beliefs quiet until just the right time and then they bring them out when they have the maximum amount of influence. And we see that happening in the church today all the time. And Jesus didn't say, be a witness as long as it's easy and everybody likes it. He says, be a witness. That's it. It also means for us that we're always in danger of compromising. Now, here's what you have to understand. Kindness is not compromise. Being kind to someone, is, that's not compromising. Saying everything's okay and you're fine, that's compromise. But being kind it's never a compromise to be kind to someone. And so that means we don't, you know, like beat people over the head with the Bible and yell our views at people. We do it with kindness because that's not compromise. And we got to be careful. Balaam tricked an entire nation. And I think if we're not careful as followers of Jesus today, we can be tricked too. It'll sound good and reasonable but don't let culture trick you. Parents, don't let culture trick your kids. I think we all agree, culture is after your kids at the youngest age possible with what they're being taught, with what they're being given to read. You don't have to research far to see that that's true and we have to wake up to that fact to say, my kid will not be the one that learns compromise. That's why we're doing the parent learning lab on November the 4th. I hope every parent, I hope it totally fills up and we have to do another one because we're gonna talk about how do you raise kids in a culture like ours not to compromise and have a biblical worldview? How do you do that? And we're gonna spend four hours together going through and discussing how we do that. Here's what compromise sounds like today. It sounds like the word Tolerance. That's what it sounds like. See, tolerance used to mean kindness. Just be kind to somebody. But today, tolerance has come to mean uh, you, you don't just tolerate. You've got to believe that or you're out. You're canceled. You're finished. Uh, we don't want your kindness. We want your belief system. That's what it looks like today. So we need to be aware. See, evil wants you to accept it, but evil will never accept you. So by giving in, it will never move people closer to Christ. We also know that Jesus gives a call to repentance. He says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. This promise of forgiveness is for all of us. If you've compromised you know what can happen? You can turn around and be forgiven. He uses two illustrations. One is manna, hidden manna. Manna was what was used 
to feed the nation of Israel, to sustain them while they were in the desert uh, as they were escaping Egyptian bondage. They didn't have any way to produce food. God produced it for them. God can sustain us through anything at any time. And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, those of you that compromise, guess what? I can give you manna. I can sustain you. You think you needed that, but I've got something even better. And I will give you a white stone with your name written on it. Scholars don't all agree on what that means. There's multiple meanings to what this white stone could have meant. The one that resonated with me the most as I was researching all this was that in their culture, when someone was in a court of law, the jury uh, would bring back in a stone signifying their acquittal or their conviction. If the stone was a uh, black stone, they were convicted. But if it was a white stone, it meant you have been acquitted. And so no matter what you've done, are doing, supporting, living, saying, no matter what, Jesus said, I got a white stone for you. You can be acquitted of whatever you've done, whenever you're doing it, now, forevermore. That's what the white stone meant. And that's available to every single one of us. That's how much love Jesus has for people. So have you tried to coexist with compromise? People who try to coexist with compromise have a really hard time finding joy. But you can do that today. So I'm going to pray. And for those of you at our Cary campus, I want you to participate in this too. I'm going to pray. Uh, there's going to be some light music playing in the background. Uh, and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for those of you uh, who have been struggling with compromise. And you've probably been able to identify it as I've talked today. And then you just spend this time alone with the Lord. We're not asking you to come up front. We're not asking you to stand up or anything like that. You know who you are and you know where the compromise is. And I pray that if you need the white stone today, if you need the manna today, that the compromise will stop and you will receive the forgiveness that only he can bring. Often when you hear messages like this, you think of other people. Oh, I wish they could have heard that. Oh, they really, oh, I wish they, I would, I'm going to send them that. I want them to hear that. But I believe this message is for you. No one else, you. Not people that aren't here, but you. And so wherever you feel compromise coming in, may God let you feel the release of forgiveness that can come through that and let you walk forward with a resolved faith that operates with kindness and no longer compromises. Let's pray. God, as we pray today, God, I pray that every person in this room, every person watching, that they know where they're compromising. They know where they're giving in to the teachings and influences of Satan himself, just like they did in the first century in Pergamum. God, I pray that they would feel, they would first desire your forgiveness for that. And then they could leave here today feeling new, refreshed, changed and revived because of you. God, your words of challenge and prophecy hurt sometimes, but then your words of forgiveness heal and restore us. And may every person in this room feel that. And we pray this in the holy name of Jesus, amen. Thanks for listening to the Devoted City Church podcast. If you liked today's episode, rate us and subscribe so others can be encouraged too. We invite you to join us on a weekend at one of our locations or online at devotedcity.com.